Hello and welcome to the video course on Grandmaster Thinking. I am Grandmaster Davorin Kuljašević and I will be guiding you through this very interesting uh, topic uh, where we will try to find out more about the ways that Grandmasters uh, make uh, their decisions and uh, which specific uh, knowledge and uh, skills uh, it takes to uh, become a Grandmaster. Uh, so I will try to draw from my own experiences uh, both as a Grandmaster and as a non-Grandmaster uh, and also from my uh, communication and experiences uh, with other uh, Grandmasters to uh, make some observations and uh, draw some conclusions uh, about uh, the ways that Grandmasters think. Um, now we will go into more detail on specific skills and uh, ways of Grandmaster thinking in the upcoming chapters. But for the introduction, uh, I would just uh, like to spend a few minutes on uh, something that I think it's, it's very important to have in mind uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, Grandmaster thinking. And uh, here I, I want to uh, stress the importance of consistency. Uh, so, you know, Chess is a kind of a game where you can play uh, 50 good moves and then if you mess up on one of them, uh, regardless of what, what you did before, you might be just losing a game. And uh, this is where I think uh, Grandmasters are the most um, uh, consistent uh, when it comes to making good moves. And therefore, uh, you know, and there is an opposing view to that, uh, sometimes, you know, people, especially those who are uh, maybe uh, less acquainted with uh, the world of professional chess, I uh, think that the main difference uh, lies in the brilliancy of moves that grandmasters make. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that this, while this sometimes is true, I mean sometimes grandmasters can find uh, special moves that uh, non-grandmasters, uh, especially the weaker ones, cannot, uh, generally the main difference is in the consistency. So. Uh, this is manifested in two ways. Um, first of all, it is the consistency in playing uh, the moves that um, are necessary by the position. So playing accords, uh, according to the needs of the position. And the second one, it is uh, the ability not to make a big mistake. So this is also a kind of a consistency, right? To maybe not play the best moves, but still play good enough moves and you don't, you never give your opponent an easy, easy way to, uh, you know, create some advantage or, or even win the game. Um, and I think a very good um, um, illustration of that is uh, one uh, saying by ex-world champion Vasily Smyslov. He said, um, I will play 40 good moves and if you can do the same, the game will end in a draw. And I really like this because it, it uh, goes to say that uh, it's not about, as I said, not, not about brilliancy of moves, but uh, just about uh, playing, uh, you know, slowly uh, playing according to the needs of the position. Uh, and if you can uh, play uh, on the same level, it's okay, it's going to be a draw. But as soon as you make some small mistake, uh, you're in trouble. And uh, well, first I, I just want to say that uh, I don't want to say that um, Grandmasters are players who don't make any mistakes. Of course, this is unrealistic and uh, everybody knows some cases when Grandmasters uh, have lost to lower rated players, um, got crashed in a, an attack and so on. Uh, but uh, I'm talking here about the majority of cases. So. In the majority of cases, Grandmasters do show um, superior consistency uh, than players who don't hold uh, the highest chess title. Um, another case in point, uh, you often hear uh, players who played the Grandmasters for maybe the first time, that they were kind of uh, surprised that their opponents didn't play anything special. Um, but the Grandmasters still won. So what has happened there? Uh, same thing. Basically, the Grandmaster was just waiting for their opponent to make a mistake. He was playing uh, good enough moves and it uh, 
basically is a proof that you don't have to play always uh, some some special combinations or you know deep ideas but simply playing consistently according to uh, what the position requires um, and uh, I, I believe this comes from grandmaster's ability to to be aware of which positions um, they should avoid and which positions are good for them and sometimes uh, uh, players who are not that strong um, they become aware of it only when it is too late so they, they land in bad positions without being aware of it um, before they you know when they were trying to, to get into such positions and uh, so with this in mind uh, let us take a look at some uh, specific um, areas where grandmasters have uh, the edge. Um, so I tried to, when I was thinking about this, I tried to make um, uh, some sort of a statistic uh, to be a little bit more objective. So uh, I, I took some games that I played uh, in recent years and um, against uh, non-grandmaster opponents and tried to see why uh, I won those games. Now I didn't win all of them, but those that I won, I was curious to see where my opponents uh, made mistakes. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you win a game, sometimes you take it for granted. You don't, you think you played a good game, but you don't really think about uh, what your opponent did to help you to win the game. And as I said before, uh, mistakes are an uh, integral part of chess, so uh, you have to, it's hard to win a game if your opponent doesn't make mistakes, right? Uh, so, I, I found uh, five uh, specific reasons, uh, and I will order them by uh, importance. So, the first one was superior knowledge. And this includes everything from you know, superior knowledge of opening theory to uh, typical middle game positions, uh, pawn structures, uh, also opponents making mistakes in uh, positional or strategic judgment. Uh, and just the accumulation of small mistakes that uh, that lead them uh, to, to you know landing in, in bad positions. Um, the second reason is superior tactical skill. So this is when your opponents uh, make tactical errors and you don't. And usually these are um, this can be decisive. You know, tactical mistakes can lead to immediate uh, loss. Um, the third reason was. Uh, Actually, it kind of surprised me a little bit. It's uh, exchanging pieces, and you'd really be surprised how many, uh, how many times um, wrong exchanges lead to really bad positions, uh, which cannot be saved uh, anymore. Um, so that was the third reason. The fourth one was uh, better time management. Okay, this is well known to everyone, um, and you, there are so many cases when you know position is maybe around equal or nothing. Uh, special is happening but your opponent is in big time trouble and then he commits um, uh, a terrible blunder or just a big mistake uh, and you won basically it's a gift to you uh, so that's very important and grandmaster generally are, are better than non-grandmasters at managing the time and the fifth reason was superior endgame knowledge uh, again basically when your opponents make uh, big mistakes in simple endgames. So here uh, I would like to take a look at some examples of all these uh, all these reasons why grandmasters uh, are better. Uh, and uh, first of all, as I said, uh, there was superior knowledge. So uh, I will uh, show you two examples where uh, simply uh, the knowledge of certain uh, opening and middle game ideas helped me win the games uh, quite easily um, against uh, players who are even not, not that bad. I mean, they're rated from 22 to 2400, but simply they did not know the, the proper uh, ideas. And uh, the first example here is uh, my game against international master Petrov. So I was playing white. And here uh, we have a normal Slav defense position. White has the bishop pair, but uh, black has excellent control of the center. So you can see that these pawns on c6 and f5 are uh, controlling the important central squares. 
And here it is black to move. Of course, the normal move would be just to castle. Um, but uh, black played the move that looks quite reasonable, although it's not necessary at all. A5. So the idea is to uh, take full control over the B4 square. But it's not, you see, uh, black is not fully developed yet, and such moves generally are not necessary at this stage of the opening. So it was kind of a loss of a tempo in the opening, and here I wanted to take advantage of it with uh, a, a kind of a rare plan in this position, although very strong, uh, the move h3. So the idea is actually to undermine this uh, important pawn, as I said, this f5 pawn. Uh, in, instead of this, uh, f3 and e4 is the main plan in the position and probably what my opponent uh, was familiar with. However, after this, first queen f3 to weaken the king side a little bit. g4 came and my opponent, uh, I could see by his body language, was very surprised. So he didn't expect this move. And now he started to, you know, think uh, and uh, spend time trying to find a good reaction. And usually when this happens, uh, when your opponent is not familiar, uh, it's very likely that he will make some sort of a mistake. So, of course, it would be normal just to take and uh, maybe uh, keep centralizing the pieces like queen e7, rook e8. However, um, instead of this, uh, black decentralized his knight and that was not really good for him. And now white has a variety of good plans. He can play for the attack on the h-file or he can uh, try to push the pawn to e4. Uh, again, it was better to connect the rooks with a certain queen move, but black played uh, bishop e7, not really sure what the idea was. And now, as I said, many ideas for white. I chose uh, to prepare e4. That also opens the dark square bishop. And uh, black is now in a, in a tough spot because uh, there is no, no clear plan for him to equalize the game. And he chose a very risky continuation. I think this is not a good move because it uh, opens up his king even more. And after e4, white has a definite initiative. And now after d5, he made another mistake when he opened up the position like this. And this position pretty much is, is uh, lost, uh, strategically speaking, for black. So white has the bishop pair, the position is open, black king uh, is exposed, and we can just see how the game ended here. Uh, when all of these positional factors accumulate, we just need a tactical shot to, to finish uh, black off. And now, uh, basically, uh, the king doesn't have a uh, good shelter there. You see, it's all because of this h5 move. And the final move of the game was bishop d4 when he's losing, either losing material or getting checkmated on h5. So this game lasted only 26 moves uh, and, you know, against a player who, who is of such high class, like an uh, uh, international master, it is not very often that you win like this. So the real reason was here when my opponent was not really familiar with the, the typical middle game plans. Now let us take a look at one other example. Uh, here I was also playing white against a 2200 rated player. And it was a Benko Gambit. Now here I played the rare line e3. Uh, but this line is quite interesting and has some uh, very healthy ideas for white. Uh, and here my opponent was, I could see that he was also not too familiar with this uh, line. so. Uh, he played, the first two moves uh, were okay, and now he played just a, kind of a general move in the Benko, which doesn't work in this position. Uh, and I will show uh, shortly why. Uh, instead, uh, black should take notice of this d5 pawn, because white has not played e4, and now uh, this is the best move, to attack the pawn, is bishop d2, then queen b6, and uh, actually, this is how the theoretical line goes. So black will return the pawn on d5, so material will be equal. Uh, and then there is a very interesting uh, middle game ahead of us. Uh, so that was the critical continuation, but my opponent played just kind of uh, normal moves in the Benko. And what was the problem with that? Well, as you know, in the Benko, uh, 
Black is trying to, I mean, the whole point of his compensation is to play on the A and B files and supported by, by this uh, dark square bishop on g7, uh, he, he can generate a very serious counterplay. But in this line, you will see after the normal castling moves, where is black's counterplay? White is controlling important squares a4 and b5. And uh, really, uh, this, this attack on a and b files is non-existent. And uh, in my opinion, this position is already uh, clearly worse for black. He, he didn't. Uh, he doesn't have compensation for the pawn. Uh, so, so basically, after what about 13, 14 moves, black is already in quite a bad position. Uh, he tried to find uh, some counterplay with the typical maneuver of the knight to uh, e5. The other option in such position is to bring the knight to c7 by uh, e8, but that's also not going to um, change too much. So, this is how the game went. Now, bishop g5 is a nice idea, I think what my opponent had missed, uh, because it's a tempo, and now I'm bringing my knight to c4. Uh, again, with the tempo on the queen, so... Here it was just important not to miss, not to blunder this uh, tactical shot. Because if I take, uh, then c4 wins the queen. And after bishop e3 and the next move f4, um, White got basically a strategically winning position. Uh, so that was only 19 moves. Uh, again, it doesn't happen in every game. Uh, it's actually quite rare that you get such an overwhelming position so quickly. But uh, the culprit was uh, that uh, somewhere around here, where Black was just not familiar uh, with the typical opening and, and middle game uh, ideas. Okay, now let us... Uh, look at the next uh, reason why uh, grandmasters uh, tend to uh, win their games and this is uh, against i was again white against a 2300 rated player uh, well okay white is positionally better that's uh, for sure but uh, winning the game is never easy and if your opponent makes it easier for you by a tactical uh, mistake uh, then even better. So this is a tactical mistake, rook b7. Um, as I explained in my tactical mastery course, when you leave many uh, pieces undefended, uh, it, this just invites tactical shots. And so here, um, queen f5 is this tactical idea. If knight goes to b6, we remove the defender. So rook d8. And now the whole point is that white has this move e6 when he opens up the black king. Because the bishop on e7 is undefended, the king has to go to an exposed square. And now this is a strong uh, maneuver of the knight, wants to go to g5. And if the black plays h6, we can sacrifice the bishop there. I mean, black king doesn't have any, any defenders around it, so uh, white, white should be winning in the attack. And after knight g5, White simply won. So, of course, when you look at this position, Black could have uh, put much, much uh, uh, bigger resistance here, and uh, maybe with the maneuver of the knight to f8 and e6, but uh, one tactical mistake uh, pretty much decided the outcome of the game. Uh, here we have another example uh, of a tactical mistake. Uh, here I was playing Black against a 2200 rated player and while black is uh, still better uh, white has some ways to, to you know keep his uh, position solid for a while or maybe he can play uh, an active move like knight d5 accept the double pawns on the f file uh, but he played uh, kind of a tempting move because if i it seems like the bishop is hanging so if i take on f5 the knight will assume um, an active position on f5. But this move actually is a tactical blunder. Again, remember that, remember undefended pieces, queen d8. And uh, the point here is if uh, white wins the pawn, there is queen h4 and uh, black starts the attack on white king. Uh, it's all because of this uh, weakening move g4. And for instance, if now he defends the pawn, we can take the pawn on f2. 
Uh, so basically, uh, White is in, in trouble now. Okay, the best move for him was probably knight g2 to admit the mistake of going to h4. And then black is, of course, much better. Uh, but he followed up with another mistake, another tactical, because he thought that maybe uh, black will take with the knight on f4, but actually queen h4 is just winning on the spot. It's winning a lot of material. Uh, so this is what happens when you're not tactically um, aware at certain moments and the game can finish uh, very quickly. Uh, one more example of, of tactical mistake, again a 2200 rated player. Um, and these are good players, of course, they, they see ta tactics uh, well in general, but you can see that only one mistake can be decisive. Um, here uh, it's a complicated King's Indian defense position. Uh, Black has sacrificed the pawn. Actually, his last move e4 is quite good to open up his dark square bishop. And uh, White's uh, reaction is also appropriate f6 to close down the bishop. The point here is, and what my opponent wanted to avoid, uh, once uh, the bishop is gone, then Black King is exposed and White centralizes his queen like this. And Black probably just has to accept a worse endgame like this. Instead of that, my opponent played the tempting move, uh, knight d3, check. Now if uh, I take, then it opens up the queen, so king f1, and knight c5. And so his idea was, if I take the bishop, queen e5 is quite, uh, actually it is winning, uh, because black has a uh, full attack here. So uh, the bishop should not be taken, f2 is hanging. What about the undermining move? This is my, what my opponent also for, uh, has foreseen. If I undermine the knight on d3, but then he takes the bishop on g5, and this gives him some uh, compensation because white king is uh, somewhat unsafe there on uh, f1. However, he missed a very simple uh, continuation. Bishop takes d3. Now he cannot take with the pawn. He needs to keep pressure on f2. But there is nothing defending the e4 pawn anymore, and he's just uh, the knight has lost its footing on d3, and also the bishop on g7 is hanging, so the position is losing. Um, now let us return here before the blunder and take, uh, take a look at this position one, once more. What would the Grandmaster play in this position with black? Uh, I cannot uh, tell for certain, but I, I definitely know what uh, I would have played and probably uh, a lot of Grandmasters would. Uh, rook takes f6, actually, this is the best move. and. Um, it is a, an exchange sacrifice, but in return, black is getting uh, full control over the dark squares. Uh, this bishop is very important, so it's worth giving up the exchange. Uh, of course, white is better. There's no doubt about that, but the game goes on. And white king is uh, somewhat exposed. Black has uh, a very decent coordination of his pieces, so uh, this would definitely still be a game. And this uh, actually... Uh, this move would be played according to one of the principles that we will talk about in upcoming chapters, uh, the principle of non-materialistic thinking. So basically the ability to give up material if necessary uh, for uh, some more important goals. And this is where grandmasters are pretty good at. Uh, Alright, now let's see one example where uh, a wrong exchange led to uh, a loss uh, for my opponent. So here we have a position where white is definitely better. He's up a pawn, but because of this strong knight on c5, uh, black has good compensation. And uh, after knight b3, white wants to somehow trade this knight. Also, the knight can go to d4 sometimes. And what should black do? Well, the best move here is to keep the tension with rook a8, stay in the middle game. However, my opponent uh, went for the endgame. Uh, he just allowed the, the trade of several pieces. And uh, what, what did he think? Of course, he saw this position, but I think he mis-evaluated mis it. Uh, he thought that you know, he has a passed pawn on the C file, and also that he will be in time to bring his king to D6 and block this uh, white passed pawn. 
The problem is that he did not see this move. Uh, it's a very strong idea. And basically this is winning for white on the spot because it's hard to prevent uh, the rook coming from the 7th rank. Also, if he pushes his pawn, the point is that there is always this bishop before and white will be several pawns up in the rook endgame. And uh, also the move that he played in the game didn't help him too much because now rook takes d7 wins the game. Actually, king g8 was a tactical mistake as well because here we get uh, a winning pawn endgame by force. Uh, so that's a very common, as I said uh, earlier, it's a very common uh, source of mistakes, uh, the wrong, wrong exchange, like uh, here. Uh, okay, one uh, practically very important uh, uh, reason for, for losing the games, which should not have been lost, is uh, time trouble, uh, poor time management. So here there is a... A game I played against uh, an international master who is actually quite notorious for his time travels. Uh, the position on the board is completely equal. Uh, I mean, black has potentially only one weakness, the pawn on f5, and his bishop is kind of out of play, but really white cannot uh, take advantage of these factors. And here, while my opponent was on the last one or two minutes, I tried the last idea to push the pawn to a5, and my opponent, uh, he did not realize that he should continue with a5. He just uh, shuffled his bishop back and forth. And now after a5, actually, the point being that he cannot take because I pick up the c pawn. Um, actually, there is a sort of a weakness there on b6 that he has to protect. And also, you see that he, in time travel, he allowed me to bring my king to h5. So he made the two inaccuracies and already... White can play for a little something. It is not winning, of course, but uh, he has some ideas. Now, after a few more maneuvering moves, White plays King H6. And here I'm sure that my opponent, uh, because he was low on time, thought that uh, the first uh, idea is Bishop H5, Bishop G6, but he forgot about the Knight coming to H5. This was actually White's idea. And uh, you know, when you have so, so little time, you miss uh, critical moves like b5, which need to be calculated properly. It's a pawn sacrifice, but that's the only move that gives black counterplay. Uh, so, he played bishop c8, and now this maneuver of the knight to h5 decided the game, because we are dislodging the king from f6, and now this g5 pawn is going to fall. Uh, actually, in the game, he was able to defend this pawn, but the principle of two weaknesses decided he lost the second pawn there. Alright, and let us see one more example here, the endgame technique. Uh, so here I was playing with, uh, with black pieces against a 2200 rated player. And, uh, well, uh, white has a very poorly placed king, but uh, his rook is active and uh, he has drawing chances for sure. Uh, but he needs to be careful. What is uh, black's threat? Uh, well, my opponent thought that the threat is rook h1, sorry, rook d1 and rook h1. Uh, but actually it's not the main threat. And he took here, forgetting about this move. And uh, now black is actually winning because uh, he will just pick up the, uh, the g2 pawn and he will have the two connected pass pawns. So should be enough to win. Now coming back here, again I cannot tell with 100% certainty, but I think most grandmasters here would realize that rook, rook g3 is a threat and they would look for, they would realize it's a critical moment and look for uh, a solution how to prevent it. And there is a move for that, b5. And now rook g3 does not work, you can see here, because of the check, that's the difference. And now even white wins. So of course rook g3 is pointless, but even if we play some move like rook d2, there is this check, and uh, the end game will be drawn, because uh, after the check on h2, white king will come to g5, he will take the pawn on f5, and this end game is a draw. Uh, so you see a very, a very simple end game, but a uh, big mistake, uh, 
and in end games such such mix, mistakes are usually uh, decisive. Um, so we looked at uh, some practical reasons why grandmasters usually win their games against lower rated uh, opposition and uh, what we will uh, talk about in the upcoming chapters are uh, some let's say finer uh, techniques that grandmasters have that set them apart from other players uh, and here I will uh, just enumerate them uh, so the first one is flexible thinking basically this is uh, the ability to look for exceptions to well-known rules and uh, to use them creatively uh, to your advantage uh, the second uh, trait of, of grandmasters is non-materialism which we already mentioned so basically readiness to sacrifice material um, to achieve some uh, positional goals uh, or initiative or attack uh, basically looking beyond uh, just uh, winning uh, some pawns or uh, exchange or something like that uh, the third uh, reason or the third trait is uh, prophylactic thinking uh, and I think I've mentioned it uh, in some other videos as well uh, so it is the um, the, the ability to foresee your opponent's ideas, uh, to actively look actually for your opponent's ideas, not just react to them, but anticipate them and uh, find ways to prevent them if necessary. Uh, the fourth trait is uh, strategic focus. Uh, basically, that's uh, looking uh, long term. So, uh, you know, players who are not that strong uh, sometimes co get caught up in some uh, appealing short term. Uh, operations uh, and they forget sometimes about uh, what it means in, in, in the bigger picture and grandmasters are really really good at uh, keeping uh, keeping the big picture uh, the fifth one is exchanging pieces as, as I explained already so no, no uh, additional explanations are needed I think uh, the sixth one is very important it is um, basically recognizing critical moments in the game uh, and also controlling the flow uh, of the game. So uh, by this I mean controlling the transformations, you know, in pawn structure, transformations from or transition from uh, opening to middle game, middle game to end game, transformation of advantages and uh, this sort of thing. And uh, one, uh, the last uh, reason is the time management, which we already saw one example of. So basically, we will take a look at all of these uh, uh, Grandmaster traits uh, in turn. Uh, we will devote a chapter to each one. And only the next chapter uh, will be... Uh, I will try to show uh, my games uh, as a non-Grandmaster, so when I used to be uh, a weaker player, against the Grandmasters and uh, the things that I have learned from, from those games. Uh, because I think it is very important to, I mean, the game that you lost is, is the best one to, to learn something. And especially if you play against a strong player, uh, it helps you to understand their ideas and uh, uh, to try to apply them in your own games. Uh, so this is all for the introduction and I hope you will join me in the upcoming chapters.